Hello. Hi, this is Ames Gross from Pacific Bridge Medical. Thank you for attending our webcast today. Our Hong Kong webcast today will be presented by our Hong Kong office, uh, the gentleman in our Hong Kong name, office named Albert. And Albert, uh, past experience, he used to work in the Hong Kong government uh, in the medical device area. So he's got almost 30 years of experience in medical devices in Hong Kong. So Albert, uh, the floor is yours. Please begin the presentation and uh, uh, let me know when you want me to flip the slide. So actually for the audience, Albert is in Hong Kong now and we're hoping that the sound will be uh, good. If you have a problem with the sound, please let us know. Okay, Albert, the floor is yours. Why don't you begin? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Gross. Uh, dear delegates, uh, thank you for your time and interest in this webcast on the uh, Hong Kong Medical Device Regulatory Update. A uh, very good day to all of you. Uh, next slide is uh, the contents. Please. Next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, today I will start by giving you some information about Hong Kong and information on healthcare systems uh, here. I will first talk about the development of the regulatory control on medical device in Hong Kong and about the most current registration requirements for medical device. After that, we will have a review over the registration application form to ensure that you have full information of the registration process. Finally, we will look at some government reimbursement schemes and the requirements on manufacturing size for medical devices. Uh, at the end, as, uh, uh, as uh, Mr. Cross mentioned, we will have some time for Q&A. So uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, well, uh, you will see that Hong Kong uh, is actually a very small place. Um, it is well known in the world as the, the Pearl of the Orient. The Pearl of the Orient. It has an area of uh, 1,104 kilometers squares. And the population, however, is 7.1 million. It's at the south southeast end of the uh, of the uh, china uh, china mainland um hong kong is the uh well it's a place of low taxation and free trade uh, the government exercised positive non -inter intervention and so uh, doing business here is excellent i would say very good opportunities um, we have just elected the new chief executive, and he, this is uh, Mr. C. Y. Leung. He's going to uh, to assume his uh, his duty in July. So uh, we are expecting some new activities, some some new energies in Hong Kong. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Procurement activities for medical device uh, started very early here in 1980s. Um, and uh, we are now having the annual procurement of about five to, well, uh, right now it's about 7.5 million US dollars. Um, the procurement is both centralized at the hospital authority uh, corporate and also at the cluster regions. So we have uh, uh, procurement activities at two levels, more, more or less. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the normal people, the normal patients, uh, rely on the medical services of the hospital authority hospitals and the uh, GOPCs, the general outpatient clinics. Um, we do have uh, some 14 uh, private hospitals and uh, the, the rich patients would go to those. Um, there's a major change 
in the in the context of the uh, the uh, patients in general, because there there's a strong influx of low income families from the mainland. Um, so we we would talk more about this uh, influence uh, later on when we talk about the reimbursement schemes. Uh, next slide, please. Now we uh, look at the uh, health healthcare system in Hong Kong. Um, we have the Food and Health Bureau, and um, the uh, Doctor York Chow is the permanent secretary. And under this uh, bureau, we have uh, the hospital authority, which is the services side, which provides the clinical services. And then the other side is the uh, Department of Health, which is mainly the regulatory side. Um, since uh, the since the issues of uh, SARS in 2003, we have uh, set up the Center for Health Protection, and which is mainly to deal with infective infective disease. Um, on the uh, technical side, we have the uh, Electrical Mechanical Services Department, which uh, provide the uh, engineering support on the uh, medical devices. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Department of Health, as I mentioned, this is the regulatory regulatory authority, and um, it has authority over on uh, pharmaceuticals, drugs, radioactive substance, and medical device. Uh, also, it controls licensing for medical professionals plus the Chinese purple doctors, we call. Um, it also controls the licensing for 12 private hospitals. Uh, well, in fact, it's going to be 14, yeah. 12 to 14 private hospitals. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, services side, which is uh, under the um, under the uh, authority, which is called the hospital authority, this uh, was set up in about 1991, and it has over 44 public hospitals under this uh, hospital authority. Uh, divided into seven clusters. So you can see the seven clusters the, uh, being divided in terms of geographic. So we have on the Hong Kong side, the East Cluster, Hong Kong East Cluster. On the West side is the West Cluster. Uh, then we have the Kowloon side and the New Territory side. Because Hong Kong is divided into three main, three main areas. So the Hong Kong Island, the Kowloon, Peninsula, and the new territories. So, and these are subdivided into east, west, etc. Uh, you can see there are seven, I have listed down seven major acute hospitals there. Uh, this, in fact, corresponding directly into each of the clusters above. So, the Pamela Yao Nadaso Eastern Hospital, PYNEH, is, in fact, the major acute hospital in. Hong Kong East Custer. Uh, Queen Mary Hospital is the one in major in uh, Hong Kong West Custer. So in this order. Uh, uh, well, yeah. Next, next slide, please. Now we are looking at the regulation controls uh, directly affecting the medical device. I must uh, first uh, let you know that there is no specific legislation at the moment for regulating, um, importing, or selling of the medical device in Hong Kong. And currently, what what affects this? Uh, uh, what what affects this? Uh, the uh, the uh, import or sale of medical device in Hong Kong would be. Uh, general regulations like consumer good safety ordinance, 
and also the electrical product safety regulations. And these are uh, actually general consumer products type of regulation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other regulation which we consider uh, relevant at the moment is the um, the regulation on health professional or the medical doctors. So it's the uh, medical doctor of Western med medicine and also uh, for Chinese her herbal medicine doctor. Um, the next control which uh, we have here at the moment is the what we call the undesirable medical advertisement ordinance. And this one actually uh, regulates and controls the how the advertisements on certain um, drugs, um, medical device, when they are being advertised. So uh, this has some effect. And let's look at um, the current thinking, the current thinking uh, um, the government is having here. Um, so at this moment, the government is is uh, working on a what we call the voluntary medical device administrative control system. We call MDACS, and this one, the MDACS, is being regulated or uh, under the control of medical device control office. Uh, we call MDCO. So this is the regulation part directly to medical device. You can see that I also list other other uh, control offices. And because these are somehow, well, there are medical devices that are related to these other issues. Like the, uh, on the second line here, we, we are seeing pharmaceutical and drugs control office. Because um, when some of the medical devices, they actually contain uh, medicine or drugs, inside or being used together. Um, just like uh, when we have some medicine inside some syringe, so this syringe we, together with the medicine would be, would be requiring a license registration firstly with the pharmaceutical and drugs control office first, and then before you can go to the uh, MDACS. So similarly, uh, for for medical devices that contains radioactive substances or irradiating apparatus, these would need to be firstly licensed by the radiation health unit before you can go to the MDACS system. And for the um, for the Devices, medical devices that contain Chinese medicine, it has to be registered under the proprietary Chinese medicine or Chinese herbs, which there's a, a committee which endorses licensing. So it has to go through the licensing first before it goes to the actual medical device. Um, for Health product and nutrition supplement, um, this uh, may be less stringent. Uh, there are, well, most of the cases are exempted. Um, however, there are some of these health, health uh, food and nutrition supplements would require the drugs control office to actually give it the license first before you can go to the medical device uh, registration. So, um, so this gives us a, a picture of how medical device registration would be, uh, would be associated in different uh, authorities uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, next slide, please. Um, well, we may have uh, uh, 
question of uh, since this at this moment is a voluntary listing, uh, is a voluntary system. Why should we be doing this uh, registration uh, if it's voluntary? Uh, you can see that um, at this moment, if if uh, a manufacturer goes for registration, it will have the advantage of actually not losing any time in the application process because at the same time you can it can uh, market market the product uh, while it's uh, being processed with the registration. And secondly, there's low loss because um, once once uh, it gets through the voluntary system, the uh, DHS informed that when the mandatory system is on, there's no need to repeat the dossier submission again. So uh, this means time would be shortened. Yeah, it would mean a quicker, quicker uh, means to get to market. And thirdly, if we do the registration now, uh, we would avoid having to to suffer from a long queue, long waiting time when everybody would would be forced to do the registration under the mandatory system. Um, and fourthly, as far as I understand, uh, at this moment, because it's voluntary system, uh, the applications are being dealt deal with with less pressure and so uh i would reckon that uh people can take more time to do it and it probably is easier to do it at this moment uh, next slide please uh of course we also look at well from the business side um i i have um i have uh, learned from uh, hospital authority that um they are now starting to refer to the voluntary list and specify this in the requirements uh, in the tender process and so um being on the voluntary list would be uh, would be preference and also would be uh, an advantage. And having this advantage would be a major advantage if you you would uh, listen to me, because um, majority you can see the majority of the uh, the uh, medical doctors nurses are trained by the hospital authority and they. They uh, use the medical equipment. They are uh, they uh, uh, hence more familiar with the equipment. So when they want to buy medical equipment in their in their own establishment, they would they would try to recall all this. So um, it's important to get access into HA system as early as possible. Um, our other reference would be the private hospitals. They actually make reference to HA procurement. Um, looking back uh, further up would be mainland China. A lot of the, the companies also, also uh, use the same uh, reference. And um, I must also mention that um, in the recent activities uh, of uh, regulation and harmonization in Asia, uh, which is the uh, Asia Harmonization Working Party, AHWP, uh, Hong Kong and, and Singapore are two of the leaders in the system. And um, a lot of the other Asian countries are looking at these two countries for reference. So um, it's 
I would say take the take the opportunity that it while this is uh, in the voluntary uh, status, I mean voluntary system at Pi now, well, you will get the benefit of being ahead of others much earlier. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Poon, are you, are you getting the slides okay. as quickly as I bring them up because there's a delay when you speak? Yeah, I yeah I found that uh, there's a delay. Okay. Uh, a slight delay. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe, it's maybe okay. To, I'm getting you now. Yeah. Maybe try to pick yeah. up the pace a little. Thank you. Yeah. So are you on uh, slide 17? Yes. Please. Proceed. Okay. So we are. Okay. I proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we look at the med uh, medical device administrative control system, uh, MDACS, and uh, we can see that the regulator is medical device control office. And this is one of the uh, regulate, regulatory units under Department of Health. Um, so, um, it, well, the system would be voluntary, the first first uh, thing. The second thing is it will, it will proceed with registration and listing of medical device. Um, with, with this basic, basic uh, mechanism, um, the, other, the other supplementary requirements are listing of local responsible person, which we call LRP, and uh, listing of local manufacturers, uh, importers, and suppliers. And to enable some testing to be, uh, to be done here would be the listing of conformity assessment bodies like the, those in the States or in the Europe. Yeah. Um, so I just uh, put in here um, a further mention of the requirements for registration Hello Hello Scott Cap one three eight and the radiation ordinance cap three oh three. So these are the the first one is about the drugs. The second one is about the radioactive uh substances. If the medical devices contain these two, so the registration to these two are the prerequisites to doing the application to MDCO. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, it, it seems uh, quicker now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cross. Now we look at the uh, MDC, MDACS in detail. Um, firstly, we have the definition of medical device. Uh, well, probably you can uh, look at this uh, in more detail, but in essence, this is about a medical device. Uh, uh, in our definition, would be some some uh, devices which we we apply and which uh, on the human bodies and which change the the um, uh, change the uh, metabolism of the human body. So this is the basic definition. Either you provide diagnostic, uh, therapeutic, things like those. So we can jump to, yeah, okay, the next slide. Um, we look at this medical device based on the intended use and how the uh, device would operate. Um, so it's a risk-based we space the uh, classification, and there's a, a technical reference uh, document in the uh, in the Hong Kong Department of Health uh, TR003, which details all this classification. Um, so you can see in the bound boxes below. If the medical device is non-invasive, then uh, it's rules one to four on non-invasive medical device, rules five to eight on invasive medical device. 
boost 9 to 12 on active devices and rules 13 to 16 on the other additional rules. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, we're, we're up to so, slide, 20, uh, slide 22 now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I need 22, in fact, uh, because uh, I actually uh, uh, jump over 21 already, yeah. Um, so uh, a further definition on medical device would depend on the time of use of this application in the human body. So firstly, we have the transient use. Secondly, we have the short-term use and then the long-term use. And this would depend, I mean, depend on the time in the body. Um, so transient would be less than 60 minutes, uh, less than 30 days would be uh, the, in, well, the short term and then over 30 days would be long term. And the risk would then be converted into the four classes of class 1, 2, 3, 4 and this is um, has a great resemblance to the class 1, class 2A, class 2B, class 3 of the EU system. Uh, so if you, your, uh, your device is already under uh, the EU system, you can check on the class. And normally, most of the documentation can be applied. And, and mostly, the corresponding class uh, would be 1 to 1, 2 to 2A, 3 to 2B, 4 to class 3, just like this. But uh, of course, there are, there are some uh, cases or difference. Um, on um, the development of um, MDACS, uh, it actually started in November 2004 when we start with the listing of class four devices, the very high risk one. And over this um, seven, seven years now, and the last one we had would be uh, the listing of class D, IVD medical devices. And currently we are looking at the uh, regulation system, the mandatory system. Um, some of my old colleagues are already working on drafting the law. So uh, we are expecting one to a maximum of two years, then we will be seeing this mandatory system. So time, well, the opportunity is there that we should pick up. Uh, next slide, please. The special features of uh, MDACS, um, voluntary system, so uh, and it use listing as the basic framework. It has the uh, main reference to the Europe's uh, GHTF regulatory framework, the Global Harmonization Task Force. Um, however, there are two things uh, that differ. Um, the first one is the nomenclature system that's uh, being used in here is the Asia Medical Device Nomenclature System, AMDNS. Uh, this one we can, we, can, um, we can have a search engine uh, to find out the, uh, the actual uh, lumbering uh, system in the uh, Department of Health's uh, website. So uh, it's, it's rather like the ACRI, ACRI system. So uh, we will talk about this uh, a little bit more later on. Um, the second thing which is which differs is the adverse incident reporting system. It's uh, different from other parts of the world. Uh, it has started uh, on its own, uh, what we call a safety alert dissemination system. Says, and it is networked to the anchor system 
of the uh, GHTF uh, currently currently being used uh, by uh, US or Australia or Health Canada. Yeah, you can see uh, on the next slide is the uh, the website uh, details. You can uh, you can find the guidance talks, the technical reference, the application form, and the as I said, the AMDNS thing. Yeah, on the website. Next slide, please. Um, you remember I mentioned about about the importance of. Uh, uh, a local web responsible person in the Hong Kong system, uh, the voluntary listing system, there's a requirement of uh, LRP. Uh, this LRP is actually responsible for making the application or registration or listing applications. Uh, currently, um, task 2, 3, 4, uh, would require this listing. Uh, CAS 1 is not yet required. Um, this LRP would be a legal and formal representative of the device manufacturer. And it would need to provide a communication amongst the regulator, the manufacturer, the uh, importer, distributor, well, and the uh, and the end users, etc. Uh, it has uh, it has uh, a requirement to make reports on adverse incidents uh, back to the uh, regulator MTCO. Yeah. Um, let's look at who can be the L L P. If uh, you have the over, uh, you have uh, overseas branch in Hong Kong, then uh, this overseas branch can be your LRP. Or if, or you can uh, uh, designate a certain company, a company that's incorporated in Hong Kong, or some person with business registration in Hong Kong, um, either being the device manufacturer itself or is a with a designated letter from the device manufacturer. So uh, the key point is, key thing is, it must have a company incorporation in Hong Kong. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, other requirements would be, uh, the LRP should have expertise knowledge on the medical device, because the um, MDCO, they actually call on the contact person of the LRP and ask he or he, he or her about about details of the, the medical device and on say technical specification or operation, things like those. So uh, the LRP should be knowledgeable about the medical device that is being listed or being applied for the listing. Yeah, uh, uh, I, th I think we so can go to the next slide because uh, people can read these LRP slides. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's good, cool. yeah. Okay, we're talking about the Please, quality next requirement. Slide. Yeah, well, uh, I just mentioned mentioned three, uh, the, the highlights. Uh, so the, the LRP would need to be able to communicate with various parties. Uh, those parties, uh, well, um, uh, I mean, those items are being listed there. Um, it should provide safe, safety and uh, efficacy. Uh, so um, about the medical device, so he would, uh, he would have to make uh, reports on adverse incidents uh, device alerts, things like those, or tracking of the specific medical devices. And lastly, it's about the uh, providing quality of service, and which is uh, also a special requirement, is about handling of complaints, handling of complaints, and also where necessary to be able to assist in maintenance and service arrangements. And so these are special requirements. So next slide, please.
Uh, with all this in mind, the uh, the uh, MDCO actually require the the uh, LRP to uh, to be able to uh, to provide evidence of uh, six six uh, company operating uh, procedures. So, like uh, uh, keeping of distribution records, um, management of device recall, handling of reportable adverse incidents. Tracking of specific medical device, campaign handling, maintenance, and service arrangement. A total of six. This is the minimum uh, procedures requirement. So, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, now we uh, go into a case study. Uh, we try to look at the uh, application form uh, in detail. Uh, the application form is, uh, in fact, uh, about six parts A, B, C, D, E, F. So uh, part A is about uh, this uh, the particulars of the manufacturer. Uh, on this, um, you can see that the form is good for class two, three, and four. So um, uh, other than class one, uh, or you can use this form. Um, on the uh, on the this partly about the um, the uh, details of the manufacturer. Please be reminded that uh, on your application, on your applications, uh, you may you may be support supplying um, the MDCO with um, with certificates from other countries, from other countries. Uh, when you register with other countries. Uh, about this, about these uh, devices, you have well to make sure that the registered address of the manufacturer with the other countries is the same as in this in this application. If not, you may have to make a declaration about the why there has been a difference. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Goss, would you mind go back, go back uh, on the, yeah, thank you. Uh, so provision of uh, a website address is also useful because this would give um, more information to the staff of the MDCO. They may not know the know the medical device or the or the manufacturer, so they can go to the website to search. Um, the um, Manufacturer should also have the uh, QMS, the quality management uh, certificates. So this would be required. And also uh, whether these are certified by CAB. So that's important on this uh, part A. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on part B, um, the first, C one uh, B one is about uh, the destination for for LRP and also the LRP has to to uh, upon a suitable contact person uh, and with with contact numbers that are twenty four hours reachable. Yeah, so uh, that's important. Yeah. Um, the LRP uh, should preferably have a QMS, but that is not a must. Um, and the other thing is the uh, COP requirement we just talked about. So uh, next slide, please. On part C, uh, this is mainly about the um, device, device details. Um, on the C2, you will see that I put down, uh, we need to define whether it's single series family or system because um, um, we, need, we need to provide further details if it's a series or family or system, uh, there's a requirement to provide a full listing in a separate, separate attachment. Um, the next uh, box we can see is about the AMDS code. Um, we can assist, well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can uh, search 
for this from the uh, Department of Health website. Um, but if you can have the GMDNS or the UMDNS codes for reference, then it would be better. For the um, intended use of the device, um, a lot of cases uh, you will be asked for Chinese translations. Um, this is a preferably, uh, preferable uh, entry. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Albert, Albert I, we, we have to pick up the pace a little, so uh, I, I think some of this people can read on their own, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, okay, maybe see uh, just the, the last, well, you you don't mind, uh, Mr. Goss, go back uh, one slide, please. Yeah, the last one there is the, uh, watch out for the uh, several uh, yes or no over there, because uh, the current M MDACS uh, system, um, there are several areas which they exclude. So if uh, there's any yes answers there, this would be excluded and the application would, would be failed. So uh, next page, please. Next slide. Uh, this is about the details of the uh, device, which you, as a manufacturer, you probably have more more knowledge than us. Active or not, non-active, invasive or non-invasive, things like those. Um, yeah. And um, on this page, uh, C8, um, we have the uh, the records for previous records and that MDCO would would uh, like appreciate a comprehensive record of this. Um, the next one, which is uh, more important, is about the labeling requirement. And please, please be informed that um, the MDCO would would require even the uh, uh, samples of the labeling, and uh, and also because uh, we operate on a bilingual system. Um, whether or not it contains English or Chinese uh, needs to be specified. And there, there is a separate documentation that specifies the requirements on labeling, and which we can refer to uh, when we make the application. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is about the... Uh, the uh, combinational products, which uh, say if it's uh, contain drugs or con contain radioactive uh, substances, for those uh, would need to be uh, applied as a prerequisite first before going to uh, MDCO. Um, the last two is about the uh, safety standard and also the clinical data requirements. Uh, normally, we uh, you can you can refer to the clinical data uh, which you submit to the uh, um, GHTF or the uh, other other countries authorities. Yeah, which you have made a su successful reg registration already. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the last last uh, part about well, uh, part D. Um, where you can uh, please refer to your U.S. or the EU EU uh, approvals, because the uh, uh, MDCO would would make reference strong reference to these approvals, and and also about um, the conformity. Uh, Conformity uh, compliance. Um, if you can try to bring in the uh, the submission which you have already made to the uh, to the other authorities. Otherwise, you will have to fill in a separate uh, form MD hyphen CCL form, which is uh, quite a lengthy form which we have. Now, this is essential principles conformity checklist. This is the MDCCL form. Uh, 
this part actually have uh, uh, I will call 17 requirements, uh, which concern about the safety and efficacy of uh, the manufacturer of the device. Uh, I'm not going to to uh, read through this. So this slide and the next slide, 17 requirements. Um, when we need to do it, we have to to uh, to provide to provide uh, justification for uh, and reasons for how the manufacturer of the device has or have met with all these requirements. So next slide, please. Uh, this is the uh, because the. Uh, we provide, or the manufacturer provide the uh, the uh, conformity uh, compliance uh, form, the CCL form, all the all the material inside, and the MDCO would require the manufacturer to make a declaration about this um, information, and also about uh, uh, when MDCO wants to to ask for more information then uh, they would they would like to have this declaration yeah next slide please uh the part e and part f in fact about uh well the declaration just signing off and also the uh well signing off for the whole application and also the um about the privacy ordinance telling uh, the use of Submitted data. Yeah. Um, the next the next slide is about the uh, requirements for adverse event reporting. Um, this is intended to to uh, go through the process uh, of post market surveillance. So this is uh, uh, a picture of how the a drawing of how the uh, the process would go through and the. Um, the requirement is that the LLP will need to report and manage this incident that's happening in Hong Kong, or that is going to be to be uh, uh, well managed under uh, on the on the listed devices. So this is the reference uh, document. Um, what are the adverse incidents that needs to be reported? So if it occurs in Hong Kong, it needs to be reported. Outside Hong Kong, no. But if it's outside Hong Kong, but it needs to to corrective and act, preventive act, actions in Hong Kong, then it would need to be reported. Um, for the reports, it has to be within not later than 10 calendar days. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the list of information that need to be reported. So uh, about the medical device, make and model, serial number, and uh, other batch or ID that's uh, being affected. Uh, actions to be taken. Uh, sales volume, I mean the affected uh, numbers of uh, um, devices. Um, the contact details of the uh, responsible person and uh, say contact numbers for for the public uh, any precautions or ad advice things like those so uh, uh, two levels of reporting one is one is serious adverse incidents to be reported not less than 10 calendar days the other Reportable adverse incidents not later than 30 calendar days. Next slide, please. Uh, there are several uh, reported adverse incidents which I I have uh, quoted here. Um, so uh, if we go through several of these, not all of them. Uh, say on number one, uh, in one occasion, there's a uh, X-ray. Uh, vascular system. Uh, the C arm had uh, uncontrolled motion and hit the patient. And 
his nose was broken. So this is a reportable adverse incident. Yeah. Um, so maybe we go to item three. Oh, okay. Uh, in that case, uh, we already advanced to the next slide. So uh, we go to item five, uh, manufacturer of a pacemaker released on the market, identified the software bug and the risk assessment so the likelihood of occurrence of a serious injury is not remote. So uh, there may be serious, uh, uh, serious uh, consequences. So this is a reportable adverse incident. Um, one last one. Uh, 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 Mr. Cross, if you don't mind, yeah. Uh, the item seven, well, uh, in the use of an external uh, defibrillator on a patient, the defibrillator failed to deliver the originally programmed energy level uh, due to due to our folder, and the patient died. So this is uh, a serious uh, adverse incident and uh, causing death, and it's uh, reportable. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, the MDCO provide uh, the list of urgent contacts, both in office hour and our force space hour, in order that uh, any adverse incidents can be reported. Of course, it can also be reported on the on the website. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we talk about uh, reimbursement for medical device. Next slide, please. Um, basically. Um, Two, two major systems. The first one is HA drug formulary, HADF. This is mainly uh, providing uh, subsidy and reimbursement on drugs. So uh, it would contain what we call general drugs and specific drugs and also uh, loan hospital authority standard drugs. Uh, there are some medical device and medical Clinical procedures also involved in inside this uh, this this uh, subsidy uh, schemes. So uh, next next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the reimbursement that's more related or even directly to a medical device is what we call the Samaritan Samaritan fund, um, which is. Uh, drugs and and uh, some medical device. Uh, just a moment, I lost my slide. Okay, I'm on it now. Uh, so uh, the um, the uh, reimbursement is mainly. Mainly seventy percent on government subsidy and thirty percent uh, private donation. Uh, each year is uh, about five thousand cases and over twenty million US dollar a year. Um, what what's uh, to be learned is uh, the budget, the Hong Kong budget, which just allocated uh, US dollar one point three billion for the ten years. 2012 to 2022 to meet more uh, new cases. So uh, this is this is uh, what we can see a uh, further of investment from the government. Well, on on the medical devices. Um, the some of the reimbursement items may include ex very expensive drugs, expensive medical items. Uh, let's try this. I mean, uh, 56 now. I'm on. Um, a lot of uh, the items by uh, uh, items purchased by patients for home use, like wheelchairs and home use ventilators, hemodialysis machines, all those. Yeah. So uh so we know uh there are more funds uh, supporting this. Uh next slide please. Uh 
Next slide, please. Import. Yeah. We look at the import and export controls. Uh, and we see that um, for medical device, that at the moment, there's no import and export control. Um, however, for devices with um, biological material, this would be controlled by, there is an import control by Port Health Unit under the Department of Health. If it has Chinese herbs content, it's import and export control. Uh, if we have control chemicals, import and export control, but by customs and exile department. Uh, with drugs, import and export control by Department of Health with radioactive, radioactive substance and radiating apparatus would be import control by radiation health unit. Uh, devices with radio transmitting parts would be import and export control by the Office of Telecom Authority, OFTA. <clears throat> and lastly would be uh, con if it contains a strategic commodity like uh, thermal imaging uh, systems, import and export control by uh, trade and industry department. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, this uh, slide just mentioned about uh, the main, main uh, local industry. Uh, a lot of the uh, the exports uh, are, are on um, the items of uh, mechanotherapy appliances or massage apparatus, uh, electrodiagnostic apparatus, and miscellaneous medical instrument and appliances uh, within these uh, three three categories, and most of the the uh, devices are mainly the exports. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, a lot of uh, us would be concerned about the country of origin because uh, with the US FDA system or the EU system, this is a uh, 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 very stringent, a uh, strict requirement. Uh, for the Hong Kong system, um, what we mainly look at is we want to ensure that um, the manufacturing size would have the management uh, quality management system. It, it should either be on its own having ISO 3485 or being part of the corporate quality management system. So uh, this is the main requirement. Um, it doesn't matter uh, for Hong Kong. It doesn't matter uh, where the where the device is actually being manufactured, manufactured, or where which is the actual country of origin. It's more concerned about the compliance to quality management system. Next slide, please. Okay, Mr. Poon, uh, Albert, thank you very much for your presentation today, uh, and thank you very much for staying up till about midnight in Hong Kong. Uh, we appreciate <laughs> your uh, staying up late and making that one-hour presentation. We are now going to yeah, change... we just make it uh, one hour. One hour. All right, we're going to now change to uh, the questions and answers. We've actually already gotten some uh, Q and A uh, for Hong Kong. Uh, I want to point out that on May 3rd, we're going to have a webcast on uh, Korea. Uh, there, are new, there are many new wow. regulations in Korea. And mm -hmm. also, uh, at the end of the webcast, we'll be sending out our evaluations. We'd appreciate your feedback. So, Albert, let's turn over to the uh, first questions. Um, and the first question is, when will the registration of medical devices become mandatory? when will the registration of medical devices become mandatory in Hong Kong? So we understand that you can do a voluntary listing now. There's some advantages on the voluntary listing now. And when do you expect the uh, mandatory uh, registration of medical devices in Hong Kong? Um, as far as I understand uh, with my, uh, with our 
Department of Health, the uh, mandatory system, the uh, the detailed uh, law is being drafted. Is now being drafted in the process, um, and it is very likely that uh, the drafting will be complete this year and be endorsed for um, as regulation uh, next year. So we are looking at a time frame of about two years. Um, having said that, because we do have a, a new government coming in, uh, in uh, well, f- starting from July, so uh, this may may or may not defer it uh, uh, a few months later, uh, further. So uh, I would say a matter of around two to two and a half years, something like that. Now, I'm a, I'm a little confused. You say the, um, the legislation is in process now and should be finished in 2012. Is that correct? Yeah, the drafting. The drafting, and then when will the law take effect? Uh, the, I, I thought you said next the, year, uh, 2013. Yeah, well, in 2013, you would probably go to the legislative council for endorsement, and we need three readings. We need three readings for a law to be passed. So, just for taking those three readings, it would mean. Uh, I would anticipate at least half a year. I mean, further. Okay, so are, half are, you, a say, year are further. you saying the mandatory registrations may be required in the second half of 2013 or early 2014? Uh, or it's difficult to say at this point. Well, in fact, it's difficult to say because uh, that's why I added... Uh, the other information is about uh, the uh, we are about to change the uh, the uh, all the uh, government officers mm-hmm. uh, in uh, July. So uh, sorry, when I'm this sorry, new when... new heads come in, they may they may change the timetable. Okay, so the new government officers are the people leading the country, right? The DOH people will not change, right? Uh, the DOH people will not change, but the but the DOH people would need to take the uh, legislation, I mean the law, to to the uh, to the uh, Food and Health Bureau, and the Food and Health Bureau, the permanent sec- secretary will change. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So again, uh, you're recommending the companies do a voluntary registration now, because the voluntary registration is the, you know, the the uh, Department of Health is not overwhelmed with applications, and because you can submit the dossier now, and that same dossier that you submit now can be used for the product approval when the product approvals become mandatory. Is that correct? Yeah, the uh, the Department of Health. Uh has uh, informed that uh, they will not require extra dossier information or submission when the mandatory system comes into force. So if you are already listed on the voluntary system, this can go on. Mm -hmm. But let's say if you go for a voluntary listing now, and then, you know, in two years, a year and a half, when the mandatory uh, registration is required, your product has changed somewhat. Would you have to notify the government about that change at that time? Uh, if there is uh, a change uh, in the device itself, uh, uh, in fact, whether it's uh, on the voluntary system or the mandatory system, you have to to uh, make the application for the change okay. because it would affect the uh, the design or the safe and efficacy of the device. Okay. Okay, the next question is, um, uh, how long is a registration license valid for, and how do you renew a license when it's due to expire? So if you go onto the voluntary list now, how long would that registration on the voluntary list be for? Uh, the, uh, 
for the medical device, the voluntary uh, uh, listing uh, would be valid for five years. Okay. And so then, uh, basically, yeah. basically that means it's already there for. I mean, for effort of the listing, uh, listing. I mean, voluntary time. Because once the the mandatory system comes in, they will probably change change the license to a mandatory uh, listing. And right. And so then, how, how, the, how long would that uh, approval be for, and when would you have to renew? Uh, for the voluntary one, would be uh, five years. Okay. So basically, so what I'm saying is, say, if uh, we do it now, it would mean within about uh, half year to to nine months, we will get the uh, voluntary uh, listing approved. So after that, uh, it's only about the license would be valid from from uh, that time for five years. Okay, so that, that's so that so basically, when they put the mandatory registration in place, let's say that's in two years, the voluntary registration that's good for five years would then you still be yeah, in effect. You're still in effect, yeah. Okay, and do we have any information about when the license would need to be renewed uh, down the road, or that hasn't come out yet? Yeah, it it hasn't come up yet. Yeah. Okay. You mean the uh, well, well, and it is the many mandatory system. No, I'm saying yeah. Once the product is approved under the mandatory system, and then the uh, the term is expired, um, w you know, when do you have to do a renewal license? But maybe we don't know yet. Uh, one, well, uh, it's the uh, five years, which they say. Okay. Next question, of the 14 private hospitals and the 44 public hospitals and the seven major acute hospitals, are there any hospitals that specialize in neurological injuries or neurological disorders? Uh, yes, they are. In fact, um, uh, each of the clusters would, each of the seven clusters would have, would have, uh, one uh, small size or the middle size uh, hospital that's uh, specialized in that. In neurological, okay. Okay, next yeah. question. Um, do both software and user guides need to be translated into Chinese language for Hong Kong? Do both software and user guides need to be translated into Chinese for Hong Kong? So I guess first, with the, voluntary, uh, with the voluntary registration, would you need to translate the software and the user guide, or just the user guide? Um, there is no requirement yet for the software uh, to be, well, to be translated. Mm -hmm. um, however, the, uh, for the user, user guides, um the if the device uh is um to be say to be sold to the uh to the uh have what well, be directly be used by the patients then it will need to be uh labeled both in label uh, both in uh English and Chinese. Okay. I mean for the user guy. Okay. Labeling and also the user guide. Yeah. Okay. The next question says, um, if the product did not re require a clinical re clinical study in, let's say, U.S. or Europe, would there be a requirement for a clinical study in Hong Kong? Again, um, if the medical device did not require a clinical study when the product was registered in the US or Europe, is there going to be a requirement for a clinical trial in Hong Kong? Um, well, uh, in the, in the uh, application in Hong Kong, they usually ask for this uh, 
uh, clinical data requirement. They ask for it. Um, but um, I think um, there is a way out is because uh, if the the uh, the U.S. or the European authorities have already approved the product based on low based on low clinical trial, then uh, when we do the application, we can make reference to this and the uh, base and the approval already issued by the EU or the FD, uh, US FDA, then uh, uh, very likely uh, the the uh, Hong Kong DOH would accept it because the uh, the basic framework or of the uh, listing listing uh, uh, or registration for the Hong Kong system is actually based on the on the GHTF framework. Okay. So um, I would say uh, it's a high high possibility that it would not require the uh, clinical trial data. Do you know any medical devices that are currently going through clinical trials in Hong Kong? Um, we uh, we do have. Uh, well, I'm not aware of that, but uh, there are there are actually uh, two clinical trial uh, laboratory in Hong Kong. One one with the uh, um, University of Hong Kong and the other with uh, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, the med medical faculties they are they are both uh, having this uh, clinical trial laboratory. Okay. The, the next question is: Our product is not approved in the U.S. or Europe, but is approved in Australia. Is product approval in Australia? enough to help you get product approval in Hong Kong? I would say yes. Okay, so an Australian registration. Yeah, because Australia, yeah, Australian submission, I mean, approval is uh, adequate. Uh, but, uh, well, we don't have to disclose the uh, previous uh, failures with FDA or, uh, or with uh, Europe. Okay. So yeah, we can um, just call the successful cases. Yeah. Yeah. So what has to be done for class one products in Hong Kong? Uh, it's not yet announced for uh, for um, for listing purpose uh, because of the uh, the large quantities. Um, uh, no policy has yet been set. Okay, the next question says, when will non-class D IVD devices, IVD devices be able to be voluntary listed? Again, when will non-class D IVD devices be able to be voluntary listed in Hong Kong? I would, I would say, uh, um, at least in a year's time, yeah, likely to be end of this year. Okay. Uh, I talked to I talked to uh, as extra information. I talked to DOH on this issue, and they uh, they are they are hesitating to make this decision because uh, um, uh, they face a lot of uh, technical difficulties. So. Uh, um, they are making more preparations. Well, because from the class D, class D IVD, uh, they learn a lot. They learn a lot. They learn what they don't know. So uh, they are now trying to make a, a better system before they start to do the uh, to do the class B or C of the uh, IVDs. Okay. But, Next, but the... latest, I would say, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. uh, supplementary. Yeah, latest, I would say, 
when the mandatory system is in place, it has to be to be uh, on the listing. Uh, so that's that would the, be the latest uh, IVD, time. right? The IVD product. Yeah, yeah, together. It would be the together, uh, MD and the IVDs, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. I have a medical device that is a permanent dermal wrinkle filler that is derived from bovine collagen. Do you see any problems with product registration in Hong Kong for a dermal wrinkle filler that is derived from bovine collagen? And that is uh, derived from uh, uh, human cell, is that? No, bovine, I guess, is uh, cow cows. Uh, so animal animal cells. Yes. Uh, animal origin, yeah. Yeah, animal core. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, remember, under uh, at this moment, uh, they will not accept this into the listing. They will not at least uh, um, let me see. Uh, uh, under the clause C, uh, part C, 007 of the application form, there are three three exclusions, and uh, one of the exclusions uh, say about uh, uh, devices that contain substance of uh, animal origin and uh, or human cells and textures uh, would not be uh, uh, would be excluded at this moment. So from the, would not from the be, voluntary registration. Yeah, yeah, from the voluntary registration. Okay. Uh, but there is no no harm to do if uh, we make an inquiry to DOH. We can mm -hmm. uh, the manufacturer can always uh, uh, arrange a, a small well discussion or a small questionnaire with the Department of Health. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can help this company do that if they want. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. The next question says, if there is a manufacturer office in China, can they be used as the LRP in Hong Kong? So I think the no. answer, uh, answer to that would be no. The LRP in Hong Kong would have to have an office and a business license in Hong Kong, right? Yeah, and besides, he should have one at least one person who, who can be locally accessible. Uh, uh, to answer all the calls or being someone by DOH uh, to attend their office meetings and things like those. Yeah, uh, the, th the, th the thing is we, for the audience yeah. is that the medical device regulations in China are totally different than the medical device regulations in Hong Kong, uh, even though Hong Kong yeah, is that's part true. of China. Yeah. yeah, we are one country, two systems. Right. One, <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, how many people in the MDACO focus on medical devices now and medical device uh, voluntary approval? How many people in the MDACO focus on medical devices and medical device uh, voluntary approval now? About six. About six people are focused on voluntary medical device review approval? Yeah, yeah. The other, the other, another three or four is on the, on the writing the, uh, the, the regulation, the actual regulation. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a total of about ten people. Yeah. Okay. So are they? Ex about are they, six are they would be on the. To, uh, yeah, six uh, would be on the. The review. Yeah, processing right? the, uh, the reviews. Yeah. Are they expected to add more people to the? Um, Device review group? Uh, not at this moment. Not at this moment. As far as I know, uh, until they see they see uh, uh, increase in the in the backlog. Because mm -hmm. now now the backlog is uh, only due to people or applicants unable to provide. Uh, uh, sufficient uh, documentation and and certificates and things like those. Yeah. 
Um, have the has the Hong Kong government determined what kind of penalties might uh, come into play if products are not registered when the mandatory system comes into place? So, what kind of penalties do you think the Hong Kong government would have in the future if mandatory registrations are required? Uh, I, uh, as far as I know about. Uh uh, pharmaceuticals, which, uh, well, in fact, uh, our medical device uh, regulation would would be rather similar to the pharmaceuticals. Uh, so uh, what they would do is to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, what shall I say? Uh, well, is, is there any um, specific penalties for drugs that are sold there that are not approved? Well, they they would be taken to court, in fact. Okay, so it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not yeah. a money penalty, right? Yeah, it's not a money penalty. It's, uh, it could be uh, uh, having an uh, uh, imprisonment. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. It could be imprisonment for some time, uh, past uh, past uh, money terms. Uh, you said imprisonment to go go to prison, right? Yeah, yeah. Imprisonment means going to prison. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh. So maybe for uh, for a year or or two years, something like that. Okay. Next question is. What percentage of the devices are reimbursed in Hong Kong, or are the procedures using devices uh, reimbursed in Hong Kong? So what percentage of the devices are reimbursed in Hong Kong, or the procedures that use medical devices in Hong Kong? Do you have any idea? Uh, You know, like if it's like 20%? I I don't have. uh, Actually, well, it must be much less than than uh, uh, 10 or 20 percent, because we are only dealing with, uh, if you look at the slides again uh, there, we we are only looking at about 5,000 cases. 5,000 cases of uh, uh, reimbursement. So um, it is only just just maybe two, three percent of the overall uh, how many percent? But this is, yeah. How, what Maybe percent? Maybe two percent. Two yeah. percent, two. okay. Yeah. Okay, so then, like, say somebody has cancer and they need to use the gamma, the gamma knife. So that's basically a self-pay procedure, right? Yeah, your self-pay procedure. Then uh, if uh, uh, he doesn't, he or she doesn't have the sufficient uh, uh, money to support support this, then he can make application to the uh, uh, Samaritan uh, funds. Okay, the last question we have today is when registration becomes mandatory for devices, will this also apply to cosmetics and OTC cosmetic drug product? Well, I don't think when the device device products are uh, required registration, it's not going to affect the cosmetics and OTC. But do the cosmetics and OTC products in Hong Kong now have uh, registration requirements? Uh, cosmetics, uh, no. Okay. And how about OTC mm-hmm. pharmaceutical products? Uh, OTC. Uh, what is OTC? Over I, the counter, like products okay. sold in the drug oh, store. Over the counter. Oh, yeah. over the counter. Um, uh, over the counter, but if it's a um, medical device, then uh, there may be some that will require. Uh, no, uh, we're ta- I'm talking about yeah. over-the-counter pharmaceutical products, like so um, pro- consumer health products sold at a drugstore. Are those required to be registered now? Uh, certain. I mean, some very few, uh, like. Uh, 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 like the uh, uh, the uh, health supplements, some of the health supplements, uh, mm-hmm. they may contain a special special uh, uh, drugs mm-hmm. inside. 
or some Chinese medicine inside, then this, even if they are so over the counter, they would require registration and licensing with the uh, drugs office, drugs control office of the Department of Health. So, uh, uh, but this is not too many. It's about about less than ten percent of the yeah of the products. Okay. Most of these are uh, yeah uh, uh, are not required for registration. Okay, Albert. Listen, thanks again for staying so up so late in Hong Kong. We really appreciate it. Thanks for the audience for uh, staying with us for our question and answer period. Again, we'll be sending out evaluation forms, and again, we have a webcast on Korea on May 3rd. This is Ames Gross. Thanks again, Albert, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you in the future. Uh, The webcast is now over, and have a nice day.